colonial history, past injustices that need to be addressed. And we've also had a chance to think about how jazz as a form of music has also engaged with these issues right from its genesis. It's African-American pioneers from Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, right through to Miles Davis, Max Roach, Abby Lincoln, Archie Shepp, Jan Lee, all made very, very strong statements against oppression, against inequality, against the continued disenfranchisement of African-Americans and the oppression of people around the world. So it's really in that spirit that we see many artists today taking things forward, doing something very, very similar, speaking out against what needs to be addressed, whether it's the Black Lives Matter moment, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, or misogyny, or um, the rights of indigenous people, or ecology, climate change, any issue of the day which needs to be addressed has been addressed through jazz and improvising musicians. Just recently in the London Jazz Festival, certainly over the last couple of years, we've seen some very, very important artists make these strong statements as well. From Terry Lynn Carrington, with her excellent social sciences project, to Angel Bat Dawid, who gave some very, very memorable performances last year, uh, representing the African-American experience, to fantastic Black British artists such as Cassie Kinoshi, Robert Mitchell, Sons of Kemet, who've all taken a stance with regard to very important issues that affect us here in the UK, whether it's the Grenfell scandal or the Windrush scandal or police brutality as well. So this is the context in which we've come together to actually do these talks. Um, just to preview tomorrow, I'll be joined by Jason Moran and Nicole Mitchell, two fantastic uh, American uh, composers and musicians who have made some very, very strong statements in their work um, on a number of issues. They'll be talking about the language of protest. In what language do you protest? How is it most effective? And then on Thursday, I'll be joined by Janine Irons from Tomorrow's Warriors and Amo Talawa from uh, Punch Recordings. And they'll be talking about the industry and institutions. What do activists face when they come up against um, power bases and how do they negotiate them. Tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by two excellent artists to discuss the question of being a revolutionary and coming up against reactionaries, what it means to raise a voice of protest, to be a voice of dissent, what their motivation is, and what are the obstacles that they have to negotiate. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce a seminal figure in British music for the best part of three and a half decades, somebody who was a member of the groundbreaking group Young Disciples in the early 90s, went on to record several acclaimed solo albums, my favorite being Blessed Burden, has done numerous projects with large ensembles, with vocal ensembles in a range of uh, different fields, is an important educator and mentor and just recently in the last few years has done a very innovative project called Cage Street Memorial. Ladies and gentlemen, Carleen Anderson. Welcome, Carleen. Thank you, Kevin. And my other guest is somebody who I've long admired for many years. He's also a seminal figure in British music. He was a member of the Jazz Warriors, the big band uh, back in the 80s and 90s. He went on to become a Blue Note recording artist, recorded several excellent albums for the label has gone on to found a really, really fantastic um, improvising duo with Pat Thomas called Black Top. He's one of the curators of the Freedom Sessions at the Vortex in London, which is also a very, very important uh, meeting place for, for musicians and for people to discuss issues as well. And he's a mentor and educator too, Orphie Robinson. Orphie, welcome. Hi, how are you doing? So, Orphe and Carleen, just to get us started, I said um, in my introduction that it's been a tumultuous year. There's obviously been a lot to think about. The Black Lives Matter movement has gone global. We've all had to come to terms with the death of um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in absolutely shocking circumstances. We've seen the statue of Colston being toppled in Bristol. We've seen the controversy over the statue of Winston Churchill 
There's been a raging debate over Britain's colonial past and slavery and imperialism and how we negotiate that. Just to get us started, can I ask you to react to this year? I mean, the, the, this is the year of COVID, but also this is the year of these other things that I've been talking about. As artists who've been at the forefront of creative music, often with a message, how do you react to these events? What do you make of it all? Carleen? Ah, oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to give you a uh, gentleman, <laughs> uh, Carleen. <laughs> um, well, I thought you, as it's Britain, so. Ah, but you are an honorary British now. I am indeed. <laughs> you guys have adopted me. Um, <laughs> from, from my point of view, as an American who's been in, in Britain for over three decades, the the whole issue of how that has transpired the whole black lives matter has transpired over here and looking at it through the eyes of someone who grew up in the, the racial situations in the 60s and 70s of america it's it's um it's disheartening to see how it has exploded when you talk about the toppling of colston's um statue for instance and um, there's this photo of this woman who stood on the platform once it was uh, toppled. And this woman happened to be a friend of my son. My son lives in Bristol, happened to be a friend of my son. And the person who took the picture of her, she's a black woman standing on top of the platform. And, and there was a lot of controversy about her standing there and the white man who took the photo. The white man happened to be her husband, her partner. So, you know, this whole kind of, you were saying revolutionary and reactionary. People were reacting to the fact that this white guy took this picture, but not some of them not knowing that this man was actually a part of the scene because that was his wife or his partner there doing this. And it wasn't something that was staged. It was just in the moment. Um, and the way my son, who's 41, was reacting to that as well, being a Bristolian, having gone to university there, and thinking, well, should we have statues in the first place, number one? Um, and the, the other side of that is that, do we really accomplish what we aim to by toppling the statues? Because now nobody knows, you know, the, the kids who would be coming up afterwards. To me, it would be like, well, if you're gonna have it up there, then have a whole big sign around it saying, and he also did this and he did that and he did this. So if you're gonna, honor him for the money that he put into a system, then talk about all of the other bits Things as well. Did, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's difficult for people to, to want their history destroyed, understandably, because if it doesn't apply to them, the things in history that aren't good for other people, it's not something that's gonna mean something to them. But um, it has to be dis discussed. And the same woman who got on that platform and received all that flack for being up there and for the guy, the white guy taking the picture, she went ahead and had conversations with people in recent weeks, mm -hmm. the ones who were throwing the flack back at her and actually ha sitting down with them. And that was a difficult thing to do because you're, you're talking to people who really don't have good intentions for you they don't think well of you, but her position was, just tell me what it is that you're, you're thinking. Why is it that you're so angry about this? And then I'll tell you mine. And not that you're gonna win everybody over, but the conversations do need to be had. You know, and, and, and a lot of these, these ways of people getting into these confrontations is they don't see the fact that it's all, all a game in the first place. Get everybody to get mad with each other from wherever tribe they're in. You can get them to get mad within their own tribes, within their own families. And it's civil war all over again, brother against brother, and then it spreads out. And if once people find out that, meanwhile, they're picking your pockets, you know, the, 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 the whole game is, is so to keep you distracted and looking at something else while you're focusing on something that was put there in the first place to cause havoc. So you're talking about all this noise that's generated, kind of more heat than light, and how that can actually blur the lines or distract us from what's really important. 
yeah. which is getting to the truth and distilling that truth and, and making sure that, that everybody's aware of it so that we can then hopefully find some kind of peace, if not closure, and move forward with it. That's an excellent point, and we'll, we'll come back to that, um, Carleen, a bit later. Thanks very much. Orfi, over to yeah. you, your general reaction to what's been happening this year. Yeah, it's, it's been like uh, nearly six months, because it happened on the 25th of May um, when the, uh, the officer, Chauvin, what his name is, uh, knelt on George Floyd's neck, holding yeah. down for seven minutes, 46. Yeah. Uh, I actually did a talk somewhere where I spoke for seven minutes, 46, um, and berated people about, you know, performative allyship of, of not really engaging with things, and this is why we've got to this point. Uh, everyone was at home during this period, and this is why people saw this particular thing on television. It, this is happening everywhere, you know, every day, somewhere. There's something like this happening. And, uh, you know, this was just... And it's been going on for years, yeah. Yeah, it's been going on for, well, 400 years, you know. I mean, you know, so take your pick. And the thing about the, the, the statues as well, which is kind of jumping over to the statues, I'd rather... Um, the changes be statutes, so law. I'd rather written law to be changed rather than the statues. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we, uh, you know, yes, it's interesting. That particular statue in Bristol, I went past that for about three, four years uh, when I was a, in a band up there. And um, yeah, I kept on thinking, look, there are all these uh, roads and buildings and things named after this guy. Um, this is, you know, here has heavy history, uh, Bath, Liverpool, you know, all these various different places. And yes, at first, when the statue went down, it went into the water. It was kind of ironic that that went into water because the amount of our people that, you know, uh, died on those, those uh, boat journeys that we didn't want to be a part of. Um, and uh, so, you know, I looked at that and I thought, OK, that's interesting. There was also, um, what was it, they were taking things off of television, cutting scenes out of Gone with the Wind and... Uh, you know, you know, 40 towers. And, you know, this is all uninteresting because when those uh, decisions are made at those uh, top tables, we are not there. We are not in those companies. That's not our decisions. I would rather that, you know, you fix things, you kind of, um, you know, you challenge things, you stand actively in solidarity, but you use your voices to challenge the histor historic and systemic in inequalities that exist in our own realities rather than just some, you know, who cares about Gone with the Wind? We know what that is, um, but that's a distraction. And it's a distraction to, you know, throw them a banana and they'll play with that banana for a while. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of uh, always look to see what is actually happening behind that. Um, you know, we, we had this whole thing of changing a social media handle or a profile picture to a black square. Wow, if I'd known that putting a black square on a social media platform would have started such a snowball effect from everybody engaging with it, I would have done that years ago. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, everybody was lining up, there are a lot of people lining up to be uh, one with this thing. But what we really need to change, you know, we look at kind of, um, you know, even the sportsman taking a knee on that. And that's kind of interesting, you know, Kaepernick and, and, and all of that. That's all great. But I don't want it to become a kind of uh, a, a, a show. It's like, exactly. oh yeah, we take the knee, but uh, you know, that's enough for you. Because mm -hmm. um, it's that knee again, you know, the same knee that was on uh, uh, George Floyd, it's the, it's, it's the knee. You know, we've had that knee on our necks for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there's just so much that we need to kind of put in place. It's hard work challenging, addressing, finding real consistent solutions to the lack of opportunities and things and equality. There's a refutable lack of, you know, black people and minority ethnic people in organizations to help to change things. It usually gets overlooked, shelved, box ticked. Uh, people have to, you know, deal with microaggressions all the time. The, the, the glass ceiling, the ghost uh, uh, sort of jobs where you're not really going anywhere. Um, so there's a lot of other things to address. Uh, 2020 just kind of, you know, we're supposed to have 2020 vision. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, this was the start to it. You know, I've been involved in quite a lot of um, discussions this year and quite a lot of um, panels and various different things to do in my, you know, wearing my other hats in, in various organizations. And uh, it's kind of interesting because, you know, there was a point where um, I was kind of, I don't know, I was, I was absolutely tired of every day 
all these conversations. So I just closed and stopped and said, look, there are films, there are documentaries, there have been books. These discussions have been going on for a long time. If you can't hear, you must feel. I'm not having anything to do with these particular discussions because I want to see action. And I don't want to just see, you know, uh, a show, yes, we're going to do something, you know, we love black people, we've even been on a bus with them. I want you to actually do something about that. <laughs> you know? And that, so provide those spaces, opportunities. So I, I think the key thing there, Wolfie, is um, your statement about real consistent change. So there's the danger in the midst of all of this activity and interest in Black Lives Matter that it could be reduced to something superficial. As you say, the, the blackout square on social media or having a poster or even attending a march without really thinking about how you can bring about effective change or what it's like from the point of view of the person who's being oppressed as well. I mean, these things are, are really, really essential for everybody to, to grab hold of. Just to trail forward, you mentioned institutional power, which is very important. That's something that we're gonna discuss in detail in the third session. And also for everybody watching, um, you can submit questions um, in the chat and there'll be 10 or 15 minutes towards the end of the session for Orphe and Carleen to respond to them. So just pushing that idea a little bit further, um, Orphe, real consistent change, I would say that there's a parallel with real consistent statements made by artists over the years yes. from which we draw inspiration. And it could be anything from Armstrong singing, what did I do to be so black and blue back in the twenties to Miles Davis denouncing apartheid with the Tutu album in the eighties. These very strong statements made by people like Cassie Kenoshi, who I mentioned about Grenfell, which is something which is also um, a, a, a scandal which requires, I mean, the inquiries going, going on at the moment, real consistent answers and action to ensure that the people who are responsible for that are held accountable and that it doesn't happen again. And that's something which also exposes, lays bare these terrible racial inequalities as well. Um, so that's one thing, real consistent change and real consistent yeah. statements. And I'd like the two of you to discuss some of the work that you've done um, in this very field, starting with you, Carleen, a couple of years ago, you took part in a very, very important tour with Speech to Bell, um, Nubaya Garcia, Nikki Yo, and Renelle Shaw, and I think Orphe as well was involved, called A Change Is Gonna Come, where you were looking at classic protest songs by anybody from John Coltrane to Nina Simone to Woody Guthrie to Sam Cooke, and making them contemporary and discussing their relevance, kind of looking at, at why these songs are so important, why these statements are timeless, and also putting them in a contemporary context. So can you just take us back to that, to that tour and a change is gonna come and tell us about your motivations for it, why you wanted to do it in the first place and what it means to you personally. Okay, just just to clarify, that's the one of the few um, groups that Orphe was on a different one. That was Rod Young's. Yeah, Rod Young's, yeah. But um, we were approached by this uh, production company from Bristol Sound UK for this, and they approached me about being the MD and with Nikki Yo being co-MD as well for it. And we selected a, a slew of songs we had, and we tapered them down. The main thing um, for me was to make sure that they weren't like the original and to bring something to it that was spoke to the people now. Because if you're an old timer like me, you already know it. And if you're young, how do they relate to it? What is it that's going to bring it, bring these things? People get bored quite quickly, even with things that are important. They get bored with you telling the same story. So you try to find a way to tell it to them where they'll, they'll feel it and they'll hear it and mm -hmm. then they'll be drawn to the message of it. They can resonate with it, yeah. Yes, they can resonate with it from, from how it is you apply it as, as an art form. Um, with the change is gonna come, the whole thing is that, uh, that song in particular was that a lot of the lyrics were 
50s and 60s, the things that don't happen now, you know, I go to the movies and I can't get, you know, those kind of things. We don't have to worry about that anymore, but right. it's a different type of way. So I moved the lyrics around enough to where it applied to today, but the sense is still the same. The fact that it has to be even said, yeah. that it still has to be said, the, um, as a mother of a, a black boy, and parents of black kids, especially moms have this thing with their, with their boys any way of fearing for them because boys will be boys and they, they run out and you, you worry about how they're going to react to things. And you, you get into this where a lot of the women now in this day and age are, are um, getting a lot more platform, but they've always been there. They've always been the foot soldiers of mm -hmm. these movements because they are the mothers of these people who are going out there and they're frightened for them. And in, in their fright for them, they, and my way is through music of doing that. So I, I relate that in music, but the fear of what can happen to your child for, a lot of times through no fault of their own, just because of the color of their skin. And um, how do you relay that to people who they can't see, they, they look at you and they think, well, you're doing all right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, well, okay, I'm one person. You know, I, got, I come from a whole family of people who ain't doing all right. And a lot of it doesn't happen. And I, of, of what I'm doing, there's, a lot of struggle in that a lot of people are struggling but you take that on board of everything else you you take away this you take away the skin color and the hair texture and so forth that's a lot of less stress you know like the uh, i forget who who said it but it's a it's an old saying where it's like i'm not embarrassed about being black but it can be inconvenient mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the, the point that you're trying to pull over is that it's not that you're complaining about having a hard life because everybody does have a hard life. But when, when, the, um, when the die is cast on you to have to have the hardest always, then you as the artist says, well, how can I put this in a way that right. you can relate to it so you can enjoy yourself because people tend to not want to come out to get depressed when they come out to see a show and so forth. They're not going to want to get depressed. They want to have something to move them and putting these bits together, having young people speech to Bell and Nubaya and their take on it because they were drawn to it as well. They were drawn to the message and they were very into uh, speech did a um, Langston Hughes uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's so quick, but it just hits right home. And to have it in a way that is telling a story, I didn't want it to be something like you did this song, okay, let's go to the next song, let's go to the next song. Have it in a way that is telling a story so that people in the audience listening and watching would say, actually, this has been going on a long time. But like Orphe was saying, it has been going on a long time. It shouldn't be something that, I don't know why you don't know this already because you know there are plenty of books and moves and so forth that's been going on forever. Having to tell the story over and over again. So you get to the point to where, how can I tell it differently? Mm -hmm. How can I say this to you in another way that it'll, it'll get to you, you know, to where you could go, and what if this was you? What, and that's the way that I try to approach it so that instead of looking at it as me being the woe is black person, woe is me type of thing, to see it as, as a human being, as a human, I'm speaking to you as a human. So take the whole color thing out, the whole cultural thing out, just as a human being and you be me. So when, I'm, when we're bringing this music to you, we're bringing it to you as human beings. So you're making it universal and inclusive. Yeah, which is a very important point, which we see throughout history as well. You know, these, these statements made by black artists, which are both specific, but also universal and have this humanity, which will touch you regardless of, of the color of your skin. Um, Orphe, uh, another event which took place this year, it was um, 
streamed live. It, it was performed, you were involved in it uh, as well, um, which I think was um, a high point of the year, certainly for me in terms of both excellent music and also culturally and politically significant music was the Windrush Suite, uh, which was composed and performed by Renelle Shaw with various um, guests such as yourself, others as well. A very, very powerful piece of music, um, tackling an essential subject as well, the Windrush scandal, uh, whereby uh, West Indians were deported after living in, in Britain for many years, after contributing to British society in a major way, being led to believe that they were British citizens, and then due to the hostile environment to migration, which was um, purposefully created by the May government, bang, these people are suddenly shipped back to Jamaica or Trinidad and other places, which is something which upset me a great deal because many of those who were affected by it arrived just um, a few years before my parents arrived from Trinidad as well. So it's something that really hit home with me. And I think that any statement that's made about the Windrush scandal, and there was also a very, very um, good suite that was written by Jason Yard, uh, which involved uh, Anthony Joseph as well, which was part of the London Jazz Festival in 2019, uh, which, and, and Rennell's is related to that in a way, there's a continuum between the, the two works. Anything which addresses that subject is hugely, hugely important. Um, so tell me a little bit about the significance of the Windrush Suite, and you could maybe talk a bit about Rennell, the composer, Rennell Shaw, who's one of your um, former students, Orphan. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Ronell Shaw is a multi-instrumentalist, um, deep thinker as well, um, and he's been composing since I met him, uh, age 14 or something. Um, he's always, uh, you know, he's very well read uh, as well, and uh, we would constantly just kind of, you know, look at ways that you could express your music rather than just going down the fashionable route of things. So it was always to have more substance um, to what you do and a reason why you do what you do. And that. So rather than the, you know, I love you, we love them, baby, 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 you know, we, we didn't really go down that road. Um, it really was, you know, hold on to this uh, album, you know, of this, check out, chain, you know, Strange Fruit, you know, check all these different things. And also because he grew up in a West Indian household um, and there was always this thing when you do that, um, I think, you know, because his mum's around my age as, as well. Uh, um, so we had two worlds going on. There was the one at home, which is very much the Caribbean. Uh, um, and then the one outside, which was England. And, you know, everything that that brought, being at school, uh, uh, in English schools where you weren't always supported. Um, you were kind of, you know, there, there, there were routes that they thought you would head, head up doing. You know, I, I remember going to a careers teacher and um, he, uh, Mr. Jordan, I still remember his name. Um, and he said to me, um, well, I think, you know, you, you know there are routes like uh, carpentry and, uh, you know, um, you could aim for something, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, you do things with your hands. And I said, well, you know, did you read anything about me on that paper? He said, yeah, yeah, I see you do music and you win competitions. I said, right, so that's why we need to part ways, really. I shouldn't even be here. And that this is such a waste of your time and my time. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll take whatever punishment goes with uh, telling you that, but telling me, you know, things that are not related to me and it's just feeling something, I'm sorry, my parents didn't bring me up like that. So, uh, you know, I, I was kind of brought up with the idea that you can be anything that you want to be as long as you put your mind to it and you really give it a try. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Um, and Ronell, uh, you know, he's, he's had that same kind of upbringing. He's been very close to his, his grandparents as well, because uh, they were here, whereas mine was in uh, Jamaica. So he's had that connection. And what was great, um, when he looked into doing the Windrush Suite, he had a well of information that he could go to with his grandparents. And in fact, the great thing was he included them on the recording. Uh, he recorded them and he, you know, um, and I thought that was, you know, absolutely brilliant. But, but also I think the strands of, you know, what he actually did when he's doing his spoken word, um, you know, he's a, he's a fantastic poet. Uh, 
And, you know, it's kind of, you know, he's aware of, you know, Linton Cressy Johnson, you know, uh, um, you know, the, the king uh, of, uh, of, of dub poetry as well. So he can cross into different areas as well. Um, and I, and it's I very much a celebration of a, a black British, British heritage. Yes. As well as addressing this political issue. Yeah. Uh, um, I think that was great because, uh, you know, we can spend all the time sort of going really into the, 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 the kind of areas that were more, you know, where things don't work, where, you know, that it's been documented the amount of different issues we had. You know, today I was reading up on something to with the time of the Sus laws. Um, and uh, oh, that was a hostile environment. Sure. When you think, you know, uh, 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 May, Mrs. May, um, she uh, brought forward a hostile environment. We've already had that. We had that in the 70s as youngsters. Mm -hmm. Though the Windrush thing is 1948 to 1971, it's that period of mm -hmm. people coming you know, over and settling. Um, myself, we're the first gen, we were the first generation kind of born here from that particular pursuit of uh, the streets are made with gold. Um, or as my father used to say, uh, they spelt it wrong, it's C-O-L-D, the streets are made of cold, mm -hmm. uh, not, not gold. Is that uh, too, yeah. Yeah, you know, but you know, they did amazing, they, uh, you know, with all the issues that were going on, we've recently had the um, uh, uh, Steve McQueen's um, uh, All Axe, all axe. Yeah. and uh, that covered the, um, the mangrove, and having been, you know, around the mangrove from various different times do, during a particular period, uh, it brought that all home and knowing that history and knowing about, you know, Darkus Howe and, you know, uh, uh, how they advocated for change and defended themselves. They had hell to play with, you know, uh, with... Um, the courage of the activists, yeah. Yes, that's right. You know, so the Windrush thing, it kind of, you know, I mean, it was amazing because it was 2012 when this all all happened and uh you know they were trying to deport people um deport people to where i mean if you've never been born there in some cases or you left when you were you know your parents brought you over when you were two three whatever i mean how unfair is that mm -hmm. um, and, so, and that somebody would sit over a policy like that uh, there are pe still people struggling now with it uh, well, there are people who've died there are people uh, who've waiting, died. waiting for compensation having to struggle Yes. To be able to stand up for their rights and the stress has worn them down. I think nine people to date have actually died waiting oh, for compensation. Yeah. So it's the, the, the magnitude of this scandal should not be underestimated at all, which under is why I think Rennell's work is so important. Yeah, that's why I think it's so important. And he captured the moment. I mean, it was, you know, it was fantastic. He filmed, uh, you know, everybody um, put this together at home. Everyone was in their homes. Um, and, he, and he pulled this uh, narrative together and his story together. And, uh, you know, it, it's been, well, in fact, recently, it's been nominated for a Composer Award. Mm. Um, and that's a big, big thing, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I know he's just done Echo in the Bones, um, which is the second part. Uh, that's, that's out, that's um, uh, going. And again, and that's a progression as well, because that also tells the story. Uh, continuing on from that as well. So, um, you know, we look at, I think, all the different aspects. You know, when I was in, in the, the Jazz Warriors, we were dealing with all sorts of uh, issues and various different things. Um, and that made us very aware of, you know, writing within our music and being honest and truthful and searching for stories and searching for things. You know, I, I uh, was very lucky to be commissioned quite a few times uh, through the years. And I, I'd written a piece in 96, 42 Shades in the Black, which went to the Atlanta Olympic Games. Uh, um, we represented the, the UK as part of the Cultural Olympiad. And, uh, you know, within that, there were various different um, uh, uh, kind of episodes, I would call them. But, um, you know, and titles and things that reflected certain things like, uh, um, uh, does black consciousness lead to white unconsciousness? You know, I mean, you know, there's irony and all, all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But it was really, um, there was a Radio 4 program uh, which covered apparently 42 shades of skin color. And so I thought there's a lot of music there uh, within that 42 shades. And I was fortunate to work with the Phoenix Dance Company as well from Leeds. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we put together something that, you know, was quite a weighty thing and it, it ended up being chosen to, to go to Atlanta. But 
you know, I've always myself, I've always kept on that and looked at different subjects and the ways that you could approach that. You know, the, the Roots Through Roots, which was part of the, um, I think it was 2007, the uh, abolition of the slave trade, the centenary. Um, and it was, you know, if slavery had actually stopped uh, and what has come out of that, you know, there, there are other uh, forms of slavery, mental slavery. Um, you know, there's somebody behind me on, on that picture there, Bob Marley in green, uh, who wrote uh, about mental slavery. Um, and, you know, growing up in a West Indian household where a lot of the music was political as well, um, particularly in the 70s, mm. uh, you know, they sang about the, the stories, the things that were happening in the moment, and that very much in the Caribbean uh, and very much in our, in our families. Trinidad, you know, all, all, all the, you know, Kitcheners and Sparrow and everyone, they, the things so, that happened yeah. in that moment yeah. and, and, that, and the responses and all of that. So that kind of uh, really enlightened me. To what I would look at when I came across jazz, for instance, and uh, was very much the funny thing is I thought the other day, my father's uh, record collection was very it was vast. I mean, it was covered lots of different things. However, with jazz, he only had one record, and that was uh, Black and Tan Fantasy. Uh, Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington. Yeah. yeah um, and uh, and I remember going back into that and thinking, you know, when he passed away, uh, going through his record collection one day. And realizing that you know I'd unconsciously picked up lots of things, uh, I'd at various different times blocked things and said, "Oh, that's you know old people's music or whatever it is." And then you get over yourself and you actually address things and, and think, "Well, actually, you know this Burning Spear record covers a lot, sure. a lot of things, and it asks questions, and it, it made me go away and read. Um, it made me go away and ask questions as well. And I think that's the yeah. same." young people like uh, uh, Ronell uh, Shaw and Cassie Kenoshi, uh, they are addressing uh, things. They are the warriors of today. So Orphie, an important point um, about um, Ronell's work is the celebration of family, the focus on family, the strength of family, the black family, which Angel Bat Dawid from Chicago, who performed at the London Jazz Festival last year, um, in an extraordinary song, she talked about the incredible resilience of the Black family and the Black family as a mode of survival, as something to celebrate because it enables us to survive. That's something which is running through many, many um, pieces of socially conscious work. If I can come back to you, Carleen, that's, that's featured also in some of your work um, in the last few years. I mean, Cage Street Memorial really gave us a sense of heritage and the importance of looking at the elders, drawing inspiration from the elders, recognizing what the people who've come before us have sacrificed and how revolutionary they are. You know, whether, whether they're standing up with their fist in the air or not, bringing up children, being able to survive in any hostile environment is a revolutionary act in itself. And I feel that there's, there's a link there between the, Rind the Windrush Suite and Cage Street Memorial in terms of that, that emphasis and that celebration of family. It is that intergenerational concept, um, which as you were saying with black families is very important because all we have, if everything else is taken away, is the ones who went on before who laid a path for us and many of them just lay, literally laid down for us to walk right. on them in order to get across. Sacrificing, right. Sacrifice the ultimate for us. And in, in Cage Street Memorial, it's talking about um, my grandparents and my grandfather was the first in his family to actually be born free. His mother had been born an indentured servant which was just an extension of slavery. They just gave it another name. But to see these people look at this kind of way of life and they're stuck with it, but they see you to, to raise someone from infancy who's a generation beyond the children that they've already raised, but they see a world that she still has to suffer in. And in their minds is how do we prepare her for this without scaring her, but also preparing her She's, she's got to be able to, and you're going to have to do this by yourself because the world was changing. She was 
my grandparents were like this together. The world that I was growing in, you didn't have as much of that. You had more in 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 the uh, generations before of of the man and the woman staying together. You had a lot of breaking of the black family as time went on, and that was also designed for that to be that way. And so you you have these. They could see the writing on the wall that you're probably going to have to do this by yourself, and you need to be prepared. And in the way that they prepared me for having to. I could have never thought about coming from America with my child by myself all the way across the pond to an unknown land with no relatives that I knew here to start a whole, and only because I was trying to get away from the toxicity that was there in America. And for me, I felt like a runaway slave. And to, to come and make this point of, of Cage Street Memorial, a story that had been in my brain from when I was three years old and seeing their lives, that it was that whole kind of way of how they lived their lives, that it was going away because people were getting into the flash. You know, they were leaving that old school style stuff that where my grandfather was adamant to stay there. It was like, this is the foundation. This is where we must, this is how we build. We need to um, do for our own. You know, his, his whole thing was he was a carpenter by trade. He was a minister by vocation, but he was a carpenter by trade. And he would take whatever was left over from jobs and build homes for people in the neighborhood. We're talking little bits and pieces. You know, it wasn't like it was just him and a couple of the other brethren in the church. So you're not talking mansions, but it was just so that they could be self-sufficient. Because mm -hmm. in his mind, self-sufficiency was key. His mom was like, you, you, what are you going to do? You're going to ask somebody, beg somebody else who don't even care anything about you to do mm -hmm. something. Yeah, your feet, yeah. We have to figure out how to do this for ourselves and build this. And this was not having to say it. This was in actions and seeing how this was done and, and more and more people leaving that leaving that whole kind of togetherness behind and thinking, well, no, this is shiny or oh, I'll go for that. And you lose the foundation. And that's the reason why Cake Street Memorial was so important to me because it was something that was gonna get lost. Mm -hmm. that, that sense of tradition of, of building a foundation and building on top of it and being able to, to keep the unit together in a way that people can still be independent, but you must maintain a fortress for yourself because no one else is looking out for you. And, and the mistake is to assume that they, whether they should or not is a whole nother issue. The fact is, is that you have to be prepared to do these things. Mm -hmm. And that's where, um, and, and that's what I found in Rennell's work as well in the wind wash. I, it was just so, um, it was so uh, uplifting to hear how he talked about his grandparents and to, to get those voices when he would have his, his grandfather or grandmother, um, he would record their voices and have their voices speaking in it. And you could hear the admiration. So few young people have that kind of respect for the generations that went on before. But Renell definitely understands the importance of that and how that makes him a stronger person because he has that foundation and because he can build on that foundation for them. So it is important to have all of these connections, be they from the wind rush generation or from people who were born to indentured servants because the diaspora is all connected in that way. And if we maintain a sense of preservation in that way, we won't get distracted and, and distraction still is, is key to me. That's very well put. I mean, distraction is, is one of the things that we have to discuss. I mean, we've been talking about revolutionary statements, revolutionary art made by yourself, by Renell, by Orthi and others. But the distractions, the reactions, the resistance to this work, unfortunately, it's still there. I, I just, I was listening to Freedom Suite a few days ago, Carleen, and, and this lyric really, um, popped out at me. Although you don't want me to live, I am existing. And you keep resisting, but I keep persisting. I think that was one of the, like,
first or second verses of Freedom Suite, which is, which is a very, very powerful lyric. This whole idea of pushback against the statement of people saying no, of obstacles that you have to overcome as an artist, even for um, a healthy debate in society, as you both agreed at the top of the conversation, all of the noise and the heat that's generated. There seems to have been a lot of that this year. How can we move forward from that? Or do we just have to confront it head on and, and be resolute and keep going with, with what, what you feel is appropriate to keep going with? Orphan? I think a lot of it, you know, uh, stems from, you know, we need to decolonize the mind and we need to decolonize the schools and we need to Curriculum. look at, you know, the examples, um, you know, my, my father used to say, um, it's not called the classroom for nothing. Okay. And I didn't understand that until I was older. Um, and you and thought about what class is all about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it was really that, and it was really kind of looking at and celebrating and pushing forward um, with positive things. We know that there's, uh, you know, language plays a big part in everything, uh, how we play with words. Um, and words can, can build up your confidence, can knock your confidence as young people going forward. Uh, you know, let's, let's look at words, for instance. Um, middle class people receive benefits. Working class people claim benefits. But immigrants demand benefits. Right. Uh, all all their scroungers, according to yeah, some people. We're always being fed that, you know, on the television, right. in the newspapers, all of that. You know, it's, it's quite uh, subtle. It's blatant if you can see it. Uh, and if you can see it, you can be it, whether positive or negative. Um, so you kind of, you know, look at, look at things in a kind of, in a different uh, perspective. So through a different glass, you know. Every year we, we push this thing about black on black violence uh, and it's totally out of proportion of anything. Um, you know, in a bad year, maybe, I don't know, 50 people die that are black in the UK. Um, and apparently that's, uh, you know, a common denominator. In fact, if you looked at Glasgow, say, uh, you know, 2000 and I don't know, early 2000s, uh, maybe 40 died in a whole year. That's a small percentage. If there's 1.2 million black people in, you know, the UK, 600,000 in Glasgow, the percentage is higher. So, uh, you know, you're twice as likely to be killed as a Glaswegian as, uh, than uh, a young black person. But we're fed this narrative uh, uh, of something. We're fed a narrative of the goodness of, you know, the UK abolishing slavery, you know, da, 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 and all of that, 1833, uh, from my grandma, it was 1833, uh, England set we free. Um, and, you know, the thing is, the, the Danish did it before us, uh, before England, 1792 uh, in, in Haiti, 1804, you know, all of that uh, uh, previously, but we're fed a narrative of, you know, we're first, we're the best, we've done this, we've done that. However, if you're in areas where, you know, the root causes of, of say, poverty are, you know, sociological and psychologically challenging circumstances that are around you, and that where you live, where you go to school, if you're constantly being pushed into narrow uh, avenues, and that you will then choose, you know, th there isn't a world at the end of your street. You just think it's, it's that's it. It's my street. So it's providing, you know, uh, 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 I think, other perspectives and other uh, ways of approaching all of that to use those to your advantage, whether it is an outlet of music, which is not to say we can always go off into uh, uh, music and sport, because we know, you know, uh, uh, that's a narrative that's pushed all the time. Uh, you know, let them run around, it's fine. You know, uh, uh, let them uh, uh, sing a song, it's fine. Um, you know, they are a part of our narrative. They're a part of us because, you know, it's in our DNA. Uh, uh, it's survival instincts as well, but it's also celebrating who we are. Um, you know, that I, I normally tell uh, students, jazz is the roots and the rest is the fruits. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they're all coming out of this uh, particular thing, but I'm also looking at the young people engaging with obviously history not being held down by history, creating mm -hmm. their own history. Well, knowing the truth of history as well. Yes, yeah. Having, as yeah. you said, the, the other perspectives. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions from the audience that we'll go to. Uh, for Carlene, 
As a black woman, you must have experienced both gender and racial discrimination within the music industry. How do you process this as an artist? Have you learned any key lessons over time? I mean, that, that's, that's another session. I yeah. think that's an, another, another 90 minutes or... Um, processing it, it, it's like anything else. If you're in the midst of, you're thrown into the muck and mire, mm -hmm. the main thing is to not get drowned by it. So you maneuver your ways around it. The way I've handled it is that I stepped back because I had my child to, to consider and the only way that I was going to move forward was to move out from being in it and move out from around it. I saw that I wasn't going to, looking as I do, it wasn't going to happen in the way that uh, was going to be provided unless I behaved a different way. And it wasn't in me to behave that way. So that meant I was going to have to step out of it. And that was the only because way. Because certain people in the music industry wanted to mold you in a certain way to make you a quote unquote acceptable a black artist. That's the only way they could see you. Yeah. Because, you know, the first thing is you're a color girl and this is what color girls do. And so this is where you go. Mm. Like, but I don't even know how to do that. You know what I mean? It's like, I've seen it done but it ain't, it ain't even natural for me to do that. So, you know, you're not even going to get the best of what it is I can bring to you by putting me into that place. But, but that was but, all they yeah. wanted to bring to they're you. They're trying to put stereotypes on you in the first place, for sure. Yeah. So as far as how you process it, it'll be different for different people, depending on what it is that um, you're presented with, the kind of jobs that would go across the board, I think. But if it's specific to color, then you have to make those choices. Are you going to give in to what it is that they say, you know, which might benefit you in another way, or will you decide to say, I'll just have to sidestep it and, and do my thing another way? Excellent. All for your question for you specifically. Um, you mentioned everybody being at home, being a factor in the awareness of this wave of the movement. Obviously, um, we were in lockdown when um, the George Floyd incident uh, happened. What else about this situation do you feel might teach us important lessons about these problems? I think that these things are happening all the time and it's to challenge the decision-making process that actually employs people who actually uh, revel in treating other people so badly and killing and getting away with it. Mm. Um, it sets bad examples for the young, as well, we have um, a resident in the White House uh, who should be hopefully leaving soon. Uh, and we look at the examples every day when he's on Twitter, uh, um, doing his Twitter bit. And, uh, you know, we've got people looking at that and it's very impressionable. Uh, you know, just being uh, uh, nasty and horrible to each other is not really going to do it. Um, it just, certainly hasn't helped the climate, has it? Or the, the, just the, no, the atmosphere in which it's added to it to and deal it, with all of this you know it's, it, it it keeps stretching the boundary it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and it's stretching yeah. the boundary till it's open abuse basically a lot of the time and it's acceptable it becomes acceptable um and then you know we will see that reflected in the young people as, as well you know we see it in, in older people we see you know uh, uh people that really should be um uh what's the word i'm normally saying it rather than paying money for broadband they really need to pay money to get some treatment because uh you know what's really going on is 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 unbelievable mm. every day so you know with freedom of expression comes accountability and responsibility uh, um and uh, that needs to be in, in included in the thinking of, of whatever we're going to do educating people uh on uh things that actually happen every day for somebody else. You've got to confront these societal uh, issues on a daily basis uh, and where you see that, you know, rather than the kind of, you know, we've seen the other thing, which was the whole Black Lives Matter, uh, where people were sort of complaining and, and trying to put all lives matter, which was mm. you know, a way of shutting down the conversation, a way of, you know, if, if for instance, your partner says to you, do you love me? Uh, you wouldn't say, well, I love, everybody I see you say you would address that particular question to that particular person and and that doesn't belittle anything else it just says this is a fact 
Black Lives Do Matter. There's, there's those three words. Yeah, it's very specific to circumstances. Very well. specific. Uh, it doesn't say I don't like green, red, yellow, da 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 da, da and all of that. Um, so you know, there, there were there were a lot of different uh, things I think that came out of that period, uh, and that should continue. The questions, the you know, uh, people started to speak uh, within, obviously within the workplace, uh, uh, maybe at home. But I think people started to kind of notice things. There were uh, the television, you know, uh, images were changing uh, as well. But I think even with that, we have to look at uh, building power bases for the people that address the issues on on the television and in the media, and that it has to be uh, to raise standards and around I don't know hiring and representation, uh, more authentic portrayals of black people and issues on screen, more nuanced black stories, more diversity in, in the writers' rooms, and real accountability when they step across the line. Right. Uh, so again, it, br it brings us back to the point that's cropped up several times in the discussion, which is reality. Making yes. sure that the reality and the truth, historical mm -hmm. truths, socio-cultural truths, political truths, yeah. These, these, these are not things that are brushed aside, that we don't skirt around them, that we basically tell it like it is. I mean, it's a, it's a simple concept when you think about it. Yeah. But unfortunately, especially in an age in which there can be so much manipulation through the media, um, yeah. it's, it's being compromised again and again. So I, I think that that question of, of how we get to what is real, yeah. what is really real, what yeah. is the, the, a truth yeah. which is which is believable and yeah. a truth which represents all of us as opposed to a partial truth that's going to be something that we that has that has come out of, of all of this um yeah this, I, I think you know, the, the need the need to have that truth yeah yeah no i think addressing simple things you know the controversial term of uh, urban music which urban sounded like somebody throwing up for me we never asked for that name yeah Where did that come from you know, what, are you going to have suburban music? You know, what, what's all that about? Uh, that was a way of shutting us down, I felt, uh, and putting us in some kind of handcuffs. Stereotyping again. Yeah. You, know, you know, it's 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 black music. It's whatever it is. The artist calls whatever their music is. You know, uh, they name that. Um, the acronym, the the B A M E, which I I always felt had the L missing. B L A M E, blame. Uh, you know, it just where did where did that come from? Mm. we didn't give that a name you know that that didn't come from our experience uh so it's looking at things specifically and saying okay let's uh let's speak let's um get some understanding some conclusions uh and then let's act on that rather than shelving it and uh, box ticking and you know and all the rest of that because these conversations have been going on for a very very long time uh you know, and, and uh, more people might be aware now uh, because they've seen, you know, a black square on social media or they saw somebody kneeling down at a football match, um, you know, but the real issues need to be uh, uh, addressed. The real issues need to be addressed and real change needs to take place as well. So you kind of helpfully trailed forward to the, the third uh, session on Thursday where we will be discussing terms like urban music and fame as well and um, I think the the growing resistance to those terms the, the need to to speak out against them the need to change them that will be with Janine Irons and um, Amo Talua on Thursday tomorrow we'll have um, Jason Moran and Nicole Mitchell talking about the the language of protest um, Carlene I just have one more question for you which has come in do UK jazz festivals reflect jazz's black heritage? Does the UK, like? the UK jazz festivals reflect the music's black heritage? For me, um, jazz is black heritage. So it, sure. regardless of whoever is doing it, uh, regardless of who the uh, artist is, it's gonna reflect it anyway. Um, if, if, if they're asking, are there enough black people in the UK jazz festivals? That's another question. I'm not clear if that's what they're asking, but I don't think that you can say jazz without in, uh, knowing that that is 
the black history period. So regardless of who's on the bill or who, who is actually being featured, that's going to be black history. Sure. They're gonna play something somebody black wrote or inspired them to write. So the black history is always there. Um, whether or not um, you get enough of that history in the performances, I still, that, I still think that it's always implied. You may, uh, different people may in, um, interpret it differently because of how they may listen to it or because of how it, it, it's presented to them, you know, depending on who's performing it. But the mere fact that you say jazz implicates that it's, it's black music. So it's, it's definitely instilling the heritage of, of blackness in the word jazz itself. Again, a historical truth, which is what we've been talking about. Carleen and Orphe, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, we've obviously had um, many, many uh, things to talk about, to discuss, to, 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 to kind of to unpack. Uh, these issues are ongoing. Uh, revolutionary versus reactionary was just a, an opportunity for us to put a focus on them, to talk about what revolutionary art is and to talk about um, what you have to do as revolutionary artists to overcome the reactionary attitudes. And I think you've both given us some great food for thought and lots of inspiring material to, to think about as well. So I thank you very much for that. Do join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, where Jason Moran and Nicole Mitchell will be talking about the language of protest in jazz and black music. Uh, from Carleen Anderson, Orphie Robinson, and myself, Kevin Rajan, thank you and good night. Thank you.